Hello. Hi. Welcome. Good evening, and thanks for coming to Appetite for Life. I'm Suzanne Dane. I'm Director of Community Outreach and Development at the UNC Nutrition Research Institute, which is just over yonder on the North Carolina Research Campus. If you haven't been to visit us, we do tours during the summer, so make sure you keep up with our emails and if you want to come visit and see what we do inside. Um, a little, um, sure. There are seats up front. Don't be shy. Come on up. Uh, housekeeping, I've had a number of people ask me about the trash can, so thank you for being good stewards and putting your trash away. The trash is just at this doorway right here. Um, tonight, we have um, a guest speaker from our institute. It's Dr. Carol Cheatham. She is Associate Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at UNC Chapel Hill. And at the Nutrition Research Institute, she leads the Cheatham Nutrition and Cognition Lab. She and her team study the effects of nutrition on brain development and function throughout the lifespan. She's an expert on the importance of omega-3 fatty acids for normal brain development. Using a full spectrum of cognitive tests, the lab is able to study brain development in, in children as young as just a few months. In other studies, the Cheatham Lab has explored the effects of certain nutrients on mild cognitive decline in older people. Dr. Cheatham is the recipient of several honors and awards and most recently has been named to the Education Board at the American Health Council, the country's leading organization in health awareness and advancement. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Carol Cheatham. Thanks, Suzanne. Does this sound okay? Is that a good spot for it? Up. It's up as far as it'll go. Is everybody okay with it? It's really loud in my ears. <laughs> oh, that's why. <laughs> okay. All right. So thank you first for your flexibility. Um, I am not going to complain about the snow because I loved it. It was beautiful, wasn't it? <laughs> so I'm going to have to move over here because that's so loud. Um, so tonight, as promised, I'm going to talk to you about food synergies and why we eat certain foods together. Um, I first want to introduce myself. I'm a developmental cognitive neuroscientist, which is a fancy name for psychologist. It means I study how brain development affects cognition. And I've added my own twist to it by adding nutrition. So I look at how nutrition affects brain development and then subsequent cognition. And I'm formally trained in um, like birth to preschool, but since I've started working in nutrition, I've expanded to not only conception, not only during pregnancy, but preconception. Because we know that it's really important for um, women to have the right nutrients on board before they even get pregnant. So I go from preconception on up through the lifespan now because they've asked me on campus to do a blueberry study to work with NC State and so we did some blueberry work with mild cognitive decline in older folks. So we literally are doing the lifespan from preconception on up to older folks, which is really exciting. So tonight I'm going to talk about food pairings. Why do we eat certain foods together? Sorry if I switch sides, I need to switch this too. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some vitamin pairings that are naturally occurring together and some that we need to make sure we're eating together so we get the best benefit. And then I'll talk about whole foods. Because these nutrients are occurring together in foods, so it's important that we eat whole foods. And then we'll come back around to pairings. So pairings in the South, the first thing I thought of was, why do you eat bacon with collards, right? <laughs> Which is a mystery to me because I'm from here. This is literally a picture taken from my grandfather's porch. Um, I'm from Wyoming, where we don't have collards. You can't buy them in the store. You don't know how to cook them. And when I first saw them, I thought, who would eat those? They're weeds, aren't they? <laughs> so um, here's what we eat in Wyoming. We eat meat and potatoes. My mom would say it was because it was a balanced diet. We always had meat, potatoes, and a vegetable, and maybe fruit for dessert. That's what I had growing up, um, and it was because it was a balanced diet. I figured it's because 
meat grows in Wyoming. <laughs> and not only are there a lot of cattle ranches, but the meat we were eating was growing on that mountain. My dad would get elk and deer, and that's what I was raised on. And my mom raised the vegetables in the garden. And the fruit mostly came from my grandfather's ranch because he had an apple orchard and there were a lot of wild berries that we ate. Um, so I figured it's just because that's what we grew. If you look on the internet nowadays, there's really bad information about eating carbs with meat. So you aren't supposed to eat potatoes with meat because they don't digest. They need different juices to digest so they cancel each other out and neither one of them can digest. It's a very odd theory. But if you look at the real science, there's actually a study that shows if you eat potato fiber with red meat, it is good for the colon. So that has to do with this new work that everybody's doing on the microbiome, you know, about all of the bacteria and the bugs in your gut that are in charge. They're actually in charge. <laughs> um, so the potato fiber feeds those, and that helps the colon. And you know red meat's been connected to colon cancer. So according to this study, it could be that if you eat potatoes with your red meat, you're going to help with this colon cancer problem. It's just one study, but it shows you that you can't always trust what you read on the internet. Um, so that's the story behind meat and potatoes in Wyoming. Let's get back to the bacon with collards, because that's what you guys care about, right? <laughs> so I ask around, ask everybody I ran into, a couple of them are sitting in this room, why do you cook collards with bacon? The answer was, because it tastes good. Perfectly acceptable answer. <laughs> um, my idea was because you need the fat to break down those stupid leaves so you could even begin to chew them, right? <laughs> That's what I thought. Well, as I started researching it, as it turns out, it's the salt in the cured pork that actually breaks down the fibers and makes them tender. So there is something to it, but it's not, it's not the fat, it's the salt. And as far as more research done with it, I'll circle back around to that at the end of the talk. So if you're planning on leaving early, you need to rethink that. <laughs> so this is one that um, I'm told isn't very popular in the South, but I left it in because it has such a cool backstory. So mint with lamb. Why do we eat mint with lamb? So when I first had my first lamb, that's what I was told, <laughs> to hide the taste. <laughs> so you eat the mint, if this was mint jelly when I had it, mint jelly with the lamb to hide the taste of the lamb, which may have been true when it was mutton, because mutton has a lot stronger taste. But with lamb, I'm not sure that's the case, but that's what I was told. Um, the first incidents that we can find of it, it was in the Bible where the Israelites ate bitter herbs with lamb. Be, uh, the eve of the exodus. So that's a, a Bible phrase um, that shows that it's the bitter herbs with lamb has been goes back a long ways. Interestingly, the reason for it that I could find that I've um, found in four or five different places, Queen Elizabeth the first passed a law that you had to eat mint sauce. Now mint sauce is different than mint jelly. Mint sauce is just mint with vinegar. She passed a law that you had to eat mint sauce with lamb. And there are two different ways people are looking at it. Either she figured it would taste horrible, or it was a peasant food and the royals, and the elite wouldn't eat it. And she did it because she wanted to improve the exports of wool. So she passed a law to eat mint with lamb, and we still do it. But as it turned out, it actually tastes good. So. Um, what the chefs will say about it is lamb is fatty and acid cuts the fat. Okay, we'll return to that again a few times. So um, mint with lamb was a law. <laughs> Apples with pork is a little bit different. Apples with pork, the first known reference was in um, Christ's time. This Marcus dude in ancient robe actually wrote down a recipe for diced pork with apples. But we don't know if this was the first instance of it, if you know he found out it was a good combination or what. It's just the first written reference to having apples with pork. So um, what I heard growing up um, is that apples kill trichinosis. Trichinosis is an intestinal worm that you get from eating raw pork. 
right, which makes people cook pork till it's just totally dry because they're so afraid of this, right? So that it's really overcooked. Um, chefs say that it's because sweet complements savory. So um, the tartness cuts the fat. So there we are with that cuts the fat idea again. This was an interesting one, just plain logistics. Pork is harvested in the fall because the way that you cure it lends itself to, to overwintering, right? So you, you harvest it in the fall because you can make a ham that's going to hang and it'll still be good until come spring. Apples are also coming in the, their own in the fall. So they'd let the hogs out into the apple orchard so they'd eat the dead fall. So the meat is already going to taste a little bit like apples. Um, there's actually a pork that's being groomed in Australia where the guy's feeding them peaches. And it's a better taste than pork, so it's really expensive because he's feeding them peaches. Um, so the, the apple is just a consequence of, of what you do when you're raising them, was this idea. My mother-in-law told me when I asked her, <laughs> that it helps with digestion. Turns out my mother-in-law wasn't all that wrong. Um, when you look at the science, there, I couldn't find anything about trichinosis, but they did do a study on salmonella. So they tested apples, um, olive oil, and cinnamon oil. And apples didn't help with salmonella on the pork, but cinnamon did. So cinnamon on your applesauce? Uh, seems like a natural combination to me. Um, another study, they, they were looking at how to develop a low-fat sausage. So they took out 30% of the fat, which has all these ramifications for, you know, that's not going to cook the same way, it's going to be weird, uh, the pH is off, and there are all these things they looked at. But when they added the apple-derived fiber, it brought it back to uh, something that was more palatable. So that was an interesting study. This one really rings true. Um, apples with pork prevents carcinogens from forming when you overcook pork. And everybody overcooks pork. So I can't say that that's why it is, but it's a really cool outcome from this pairing that was going on naturally and then scientists are going, why are we doing that? It was a really interesting outcome from just researching why we do do it. Okay. Everybody's favorite. <laughs> I already heard some comments about this one tonight. But I put this in here because while I was researching why you would want to eat cheese with wine, I came across the coolest quote. It's from um, Live Science on Food Pairings. It says, many of the world's most beloved food combinations pair an astringent food, which causes the mouth to pucker up, with a fatty food, which makes the mouth feel slippery. <laughs> Which just cracked me up, but it's true if you think about it. <laughs> so, um, slippery mouths aside, um, the science behind it is actually there was a study done at Ohio State that showed that eating lycopene, which is um, the phytochemical in red foods, so red grapes, lycopene, with a fatty food results in 4.4 times higher lycopene absorption. So, the the fat is aiding the phytochemicals to get absorbed into the body. And um, we're going to explore that further here in a minute. But food pairings recap. So all of them taste good together, right? That was, <laughs> and they're broken sunglasses, too. It's like reuse, recycle. <laughs> they're broken right here. <laughs> they just found an old pair of broken sunglasses, popped them on the pig. <laughs> picture kids nowadays right <laughs> so the one thing that we've found in common is is they taste good together right so either people through the years have just started eating foods that taste good together that miraculously are also working in the body or they taste good together because you're supposed to be eating them together and it makes sense from an animal point of view we're animals right an animal in nature is going to, we think about it as they're instinctively eating their natural food, but maybe they're just eating the stuff that tastes good. You don't know, they could be eating stuff that tastes good. 
And so the foods may be tasting good together because we're supposed to eat them together. There's a reason for it. And I know some of you are sitting there going, wait a minute, Big Macs taste good. We're talking about natural food, right? Animals in the wild are picking natural food, and we should be too, and there's nothing natural about a Big Mac. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so we're talking about whole foods that are good, coming from the ground type of foods. Um, so let's move away from food pairings for a little bit and talk about vitamins and how they work together. So you know about vitamin D. Um, and most of the time you hear about vitamin D with calcium. So calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium are all minerals that contribute to bone strength. And vitamin D is in charge of helping those. So when those minerals are in low supply in the body, vitamin D steps in and helps them be ab absorbed into the bones and strengthens the bones. It's pretty easy to get vitamin D. You need unprotected sun. That's all you do. You go out in the sun with your arms and legs bare for 20 minutes and then put your sunscreen on and you'll have all the vitamin D that you need um, provided that your body is working appropriately. So vitamin D and minerals are really important for bone strength and you can, just, you can strengthen your bones just by playing outside. That's a pretty easy gift there. B vitamins are very interesting. So there's B1 through 12, B15, and B17 so far. Um, you know these by different names, niacin, choline, thiamin, um, folic acid, they're all B vitamins. And you know those by their real names, but you know B12 is B12. It's because of that. That's B12's name. We, I don't even want to try to pronounce that. So. <laughs> So B12 is going to be B12, but the other ones are also B vitamins. You just don't know it because you know their actual names. They are so closely related that they were once thought to be one vitamin. Um, same thing for vitamin D. Vitamin D now has vitamin 2, 1, 2, 3, and 4, I believe. Um, once thought to be one vitamin. And it's because they show up in the same places together, because they work well together. They're actually needed to work together. So you can see here there's all these different functions of the B vitamins, but they're in little clusters because they need their buddies to work well. So it's a synergistic activity within the B vitamins. So if any of you are the, of the type that say that they're drinking beer because it has a lot of B vitamins, <laughs> I have to have a beer, I gotta get my B vitamins, right? Unfortunately, ethanol negates the B vitamins and keeps them from being absorbed. So. so they will not be absorbed in the presence of ethanol. Unfortunately, that excuse doesn't fly anymore. Um, vitamin C and iron is a very important one. We can't absorb the food, all of the iron, from any of the food that we have. But with vitamin C on board, it becomes a little more possible. Vitamin C helps iron be absorbed into the system, which is um, really interesting if you think about taking vitamin C for a cold or something, because iron improves red blood cells, which moves oxygen to your cells. So the idea behind taking vitamin C when you're sick could be because you want to move oxygen to the cell so it can repair itself. So the this, this synergy between iron and vitamin C may actually be helping your immune system. So I thought that one was really interesting. Um, and there's common pairings that go with that too. Things that you wouldn't think about, like beef and broccoli. Beef has iron, um, broccoli has vitamin C. So beef and broccoli together give you the iron and vitamin C that you need. And for the vegetarians in the room, spinach and strawberry salad. We're eating these combinations all the time. We just don't even know it. Spinach has a lot of iron. Strawberries have the vitamin C. I don't know why Popeye wasn't eating his strawberries along with it, but he should have been two fist in it if he really wanted to get some oxygen to his muscles. So um, this one's going to go a little bit longer because this is what I actually study, the fatty acids. And I recently started studying 
fatty acids in conjunction with other nutrients. So why are all of these same nutrients always showing up in these foods? Um, so every cell in your body has fatty acids. And I'll show you a schematic in a minute that explains that a little bit better. Fatty acids are really important in the brain. Um, the brain has a lot of fat, a, a lot of fat, but most of it is DHA, which is the fatty acid that I study that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, fatty acids want to be in the brain, but they're stored in the liver. So all of your fatty acid stores are in the liver, and they have to get from the liver to the brain. And that requires choline, which is a B vitamin. The problem is fatty acids oxidize. That means that if they're exposed to the world unprotected for too long, their um, electrons get stripped off, and they become a different kind of a compound that can't interact with the other cells in the body in the way that you would expect. So they become oxidized. They get um, attacked by free radicals, and that becomes a problem. There was something else I wanted to say there, but I forgot. <laughs> so here's the schematic of a, a neuron. This is a neuron in the brain. And if you look at the cell wall here, these are fatty acids. And this little head is choline. So these heads on top are choline and um, two other properties. And the little tails that hang down are the fatty acids. So some fatty acids have floppy tails. DHA is one of them, so that um, when you want to embed one of these receptors, right there, when a receptor wants to get into the cell wall, the tails will move out of the way. So it's kind of like um, when you're running through a grassy field compared to a forest. right? You move through the grassy field, the grass moves out of the way. That's DHA tails. The other kinds of fatty acids are stiffer, so when you run through the forest, you run into trees and stuff, and it doesn't move out. And you want it to move out, because this is at the synapse, there where the neurons talk to each other. Everything that happens in the synapse, this is neurotransmitters that are in neurovesicles that need to be moved across the synapse so that they can be picked up by the receptors. This, the synapse has to open up, and this has to open up, and everything has to move across and the receptors have to be available. So everything that's happening at that junction between two neurons when they're trying to talk to each other requires DHA so that you can increase what's called the fluidity of the information. So DHA is really important in the brain. And it was, um, came to light recently that there are other nutrients that are co-localized with everywhere you find DHA in the brain, which is DHA is the most prominent fatty acid in the brain. Everywhere where you find DHA, you also find lutein and you find natural vitamin E. So what are they doing there? They are actually antioxidants. So they're protecting the DHA from being oxidized. So the first thing that happens when DHA wants to leave the liver, it gets all packaged up with the choline head, becomes a phospholipid, and then it gets packaged in cholesterol, actually, and is protected by antioxidants as it goes up to the brain. And it keeps the free radicals away and keeps it from stealing those electrons. So you end up with DHA in the brain that can actually do its job. So it's really important that you have the, the antioxidant protection for the DHA so that it can get to the brain. Now, I promise you there's not going to be very many of these, but here's a graph. <laughs> <coughs> this is a study done by Liz Johnson with older women. Um, they were 60 to 80 years old. She put them on four months of supplementation. Um, there was a control group that was getting a placebo. There was a group that was on just DHA. There was a group that was on just lutein. And there was a group that was on DHA and lutein. Lutein is an antioxidant. So um, you would predict that the, they would do better if they had the antioxidant protection for the DHA. You can see for verbal fluency, so blue is control. The red is DHA, the green is lutein, and the purple is lutein and DHA. For verbal fluency, which is just I give you a category and you name as many things you can think of, like I say musical instruments, and you name as many musical instruments that you can think of, and that's your score. Pretty easy task. Um, you can see that 
with DHA, they did significantly better. And with lutein, significantly better. And with lutein and DHA, they did the same as with lutein pretty much. The delayed recall, which is I give you a list of 10 words, and you have to remember them. And I'm going to ask you about them 30 minutes from now. How many of those words could you remember? So the control didn't do much better. For just DHA, there was no difference between um, they baseline and um, outcome. They didn't do any better. Lutein did a little bit better. But you can see when you add the lutein to the DHA, you get a huge difference in the brain's ability to hold information across those 30 minutes. Notably, DHA did not make a difference. You had to put the antioxidant with the fatty acid for the difference to happen. OK? So you probably wondered, how are we ever going to know what to eat? <laughs> So um, I know some of you are taking good notes. That's good. Suzanne also asked me to write an article for our upcoming edition of Sound Bites, which you can subscribe to right there at that website. You can, as we've been talking about, you can go by instinct and taste. If it tastes good together and it's a whole food that was grown in the dirt and not at McDonald's, um, it's going to be good for you. Or you can eat a variety of whole foods. I'm going to hang on for a minute so people can write down that website because I see them doing it. <laughs> it's like Jeopardy. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Everybody got it? Yeah? Okay. So, why Whole Foods? Um, you might think about a mango or an orange. Mango is what I usually use because I usually give talks in the Philippines and that's like their fruit. So, um, that would be what the doctor would tell you to eat if, you, if he wanted you to up your vitamin C, right? But is it just vitamin C? There's your vitamin C. It's a good portion of vitamin C. I think it's 78% of the vitamin C that you supposedly need for the day. Importantly, it has fiber. The whole food is a food matrix. The fiber is really important for vitamin C because vitamin C is water soluble. It will just go out and be excreted if you don't do something to slow it down so it can be absorbed by the body. The fiber slows it down so that it can be absorbed and utilized by the body before it's excreted. So you wouldn't get that if you're just drinking mango juice or something or taking a vitamin C pill. Um, you need the fiber to help it be absorbed. There's fatty acids in a mango. I don't know if you knew that, but there are fatty acids in a mango. So also in the mango, you're going to find that there, um, that there is, which one is that? The, vi the natural vitamin E is there t to supposedly help the fatty acids get to where they need to be or vice versa for the fatty acids to help the vitamin E work to get to where it needs to be because they help each other. It's a synergistic relationship. And there's also choline, which, as I talked about, the fatty acids need so they can get from the liver to the brain safely. Um, so this is where my work comes in. And I'll try to keep it as, as light as possible. But I know too much about it, so if I get too deep, just raise your hand. <laughs> so um, I did a study looking at human milk. And if the nutrients in human milk, they're all there, natural vitamin E, lutein, choline, and the DHA. When I did this study, I had not hit on the natural vitamin E idea. So the study was about lutein, choline, and DHA. This is what babies look like when they come to my lab. <laughs> this little net reads, so when you think you give off electrical activity and this net has sensors on it that records that activity whatever comes up to the scalp it records and um, then I can do a number of things with it but once you get the net on them and get them all happy you set them on their mom's lap in front of a computer and you show them something like this So 
um, they see 100 pictures. They would see 70 of the snail and then 30 brand new things that they'd see one time only. So what I do then is I look at what I take all of the things when they're looking at their familiar picture, the snail, average that together, brain activity when they're looking at the um, novel pictures and average that together. And I can tell what's going on. Um, I didn't put a waveform in here, I should have. Basically what I'm looking for is I can tell how long it took the brain to process, to start processing. I can tell how deep that processing went and how long it took to process the image that's on the screen. And remember we're looking at Choline, because choline and DHA are co-localized at every neuron in the brain, and they're important for moving stuff across the synapse. It's important that they're together. So I'm not even going to pretend to tell you guys <laughs> what this is. Um, basically, it's a model. DHA is along the bottom. Choline is in the middle. The green line is high choline. The red line is mean choline. And the black line is low choline in their breast milk, not in, not in their blood or anything. It's in the breast milk that they were consuming. Um, this is latency. So how long from the time that picture came on the screen did it take them to start processing the image? So you want that to be a low number, right? So this, and this is also central. So this is the information that was coming up to the scalp right here, the top of the head. You want it to be a low number. So there's high DHA and high choline. The babies that had the high DHA and high choline in their breast milk were doing better as far as getting their brain kicked into gear and start processing the information that, they, that was in front of them. Same thing for midline. So this is all the sensors down the top of the head. High DHA and high choline. And in case you still weren't believing me, frontal, so the sensors here in the front of the head. Same thing, high DHA and high choline. So if these babies' moms had the proper amounts of choline and DHA in her breast milk, they were doing better. And this, these data go on. I have looked at it so many different ways and by genetics and all sorts of different ways. Um, the quality of the breast milk and the nutrients that are working together is very important for babies' brain. Even This was at six months. I forgot to tell you that part. These babies were six months old. Six months, they can't tell you what they remember, they can't tell you what they're processing, but they can, their brain can tell me. So it's fun work, we have a lot of fun doing it. But what we've managed to conclude is DHA needs choline. Work by other people, um, mostly at Abbott Laboratories, have shown that natural vitamin E is also important. And lutein is very important. That work is being done um, by the Renzi Hammonds and um, Liz Johnson, whose work I showed you. So how do we know it's important? Where did we get the idea that it was important? These are not only appearing in the brain together, but they're appearing in nature together. These nutrients are always together in food um, or popular food combos. So eggs, which by definition, eggs are for brain development, right? They're for development of a fetus. That's what eggs do. But um, they contain DHA, choline, lutein. They contain it all. Liver, which I've never been able to eat liver. And so I, I thought this picture was funny. It's how I learned to eat liver without, um, what to say, without gagging on it. <laughs> so liver has a lot of iron, but it also has vitamin E. And it has vitamin C, if you can believe that. <laughs> um, so it has the natural vitamin E, and it has the DHA. It has a lot of fatty acids. The same with salmon, a lot of fatty acids but it also has the natural vitamin E and choline. All of your fruits and vegetables, all of your vegetables have a type of omega-3 that we could get into later about how you do the conversion. It's not DHA. Some of them have DHA, but it's not always DHA. It's a different kind. So all of these DHA team foods are working. They have the synergistic activity going on in them because nature knew that in order for that nutrient to be useful, it was going to have to have these other nutrients on board. I find that fascinating. So back to some food pairings. This is going to make more sense this time. <laughs> Avocados and salsa. 
So carotenoids, which is lutein, is one of them, right? Um, they're hydrophobic, which means they're afraid of water. In order for them to be made bioavailable, to be used in the body, they need bile. So bile is the only way that they're going to get over their fear of water and be useful to the body. Fatty acids produce bile. So the fatty acids are actually working to get the nutrients from the food that they need, which is another fascinating aspect. So the fats are increasing the bile, which increases the lutein that's going to protect them when they need to move through the body. So the oxidizable food is seeking out the antioxidants that it needs. Um, so avocados um, have a lot of monounsaturated fatty acids, so they have a lot of fatty acids that are really important. The so-called good fats are in avocados. You put them in the salsa and it's going to react with the lycopene in the red stuff, and it's going to react with the lutein in the green stuff, and it's going to be the perfect combination. Um, and things like the spinach and the egg. The egg has all the fatty acids, and the spinach has the lutein. So that combination there is also going to be a good way to get the fatty acids into your body and keep them protected so they can do their job. So as I promised, back to the colored greens. So older folks don't absorb vitamin E as well as younger folks, which was a surprise to me. I'm like, but really? <laughs> didn't know that. Um, coloreds have a high vitamin E content, also something I didn't know. I learned so much right in this talk. <laughs> so this, um, this group in, at Ohio State that I already mentioned, they grew some coloreds in water that contained an isotope that got into the vitamin E content. So it's a way that they could trace the vitamin E as it went around people's systems. And then they fed it to people, along with different levels of fat in in the food. They very carefully controlled all their diets. Everybody had to eat the kind of the meals from the study, um, which if you participate over at the NRI, you know that's what we do too. You have to eat the study food, which, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, and what they found that was that for the people that had 15% higher lipids, fatty acids in their bloodstream, they had 25% higher vitamin E because the vitamin E and the lipids were traveling together and they were, they were working to grab on. And um, so it's a synergistic relationship. So bacon and collards actually has a reason. Um, and the um, avocado is a good way for vegetarians to deal with this because you need those fats in order to pull out the antioxidants from your vegetables. Um, so to summarize, Food is a symphony. No food plays a solo. Um, they're all working together. They're appearing in nature together for a reason. And you need to eat whole foods for them to be the most beneficial. And it's easy to do because they're color coded. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but all the red foods are lycopene. All the orange foods have the beta carotene. All the green foods have the lutein. The blue and purple foods are anthocyanin. Cyan, cyan's actually in the name, so that's easy to remember. And the white has anthoxanthins. So if you, what I tell my kindergarten kids is you need to eat a rainbow. So if you make sure you're getting a very colorful diet, you're going to be covering all those different phytochemicals, and they're all antioxidants. Um, so if you eat all of the color-coded foods with quality fat, so we're going to add fats to it. This is what the picture that you would get if you searched for good fats on the internet. So you've got your avocado, your salmon, some nuts, um, that type of thing. But I'm also going to suggest that if you're eating quality meats, you should be eating beef also. And by quality, I mean grass-fed beef, if you can afford it. There's, the reason behind that is, remember I said there's a different kind of fatty acids in the vegetables, your body can take that kind of fatty acid and turn it into DHA, right? So the cows do the same thing. If they're eating grass, they take the grass, fatty acid, alpha-linolenic acid, and they turn it into DHA, which they deposit in their meat, and then you benefit from that. If they're being fed the corn lot diet, 
for that the corn that they feed at the feedlot, they don't get that. So they will not that type of meat does not have good DHA in it. Only grass-fed animals, pasture-raised chickens, those type of meats will have more DHA in their eggs and in their meat. Okay, does that make sense? So um, that's what I'm going to leave you with, is a suggestion that you eat a rainbow with a good chunk of quality meat on it. <laughs> and I just love this picture, so. <laughs> but anyway, that is pretty much all I had to say, um, and I'll take some questions now. Uh-huh. The white one. There you go. <laughs> I don't know if that would work. It's probably better than just taking a vitamin C supplement. I don't believe in supplements, so I don't I don't know for sure, but that that's certainly a good strategy. Yes. Uh-huh. That is a really good question. I don't know of any study that's been done. Did everybody hear that question? So she was asking if there's been a study done to look at whether or not colon cancer is, the relation between colon cancer and red meat is different, whether it's grass-fed versus the feedlot meat. Um, it's my understanding, and I could be totally wrong because this is just a layperson's understanding, that the reason that the beef is connected to the colon cancer is because of the way it's cooked. So like if you cook it on the grill and it gets that charcoal on it, that that's the problem. So if you took a piece of grass-fed beef and you cooked it in the same way, you would most likely have the same issue. But that's my layperson's understanding of why the relationship between colon cancer and meat exists. Yes? As far as colon cancer? Okay, so the question is wild meat versus beef. Um, wild meat is leaner. It is hopefully a natural diet, so it's going to be better meat for you. Um, I'm a little partial because that's the way I grew up, and I think I grew up smart, so. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure the meat had something to do with building my brain. Um, but I, don't, I also don't know of any studies of people doing, doing that. But I do know that as far as meat quality goes, it's a higher quality meat. If it's, if it's just natural in the mountains, yeah. Um, and it, there are places, even in Wyoming, where they have elk farms, where they're growing elk to sell to people. <laughs> and that wouldn't be the same kind of meat as what my dad used to shoot back 40 years ago, right? Yes. Um, no, I actually can't explain that. But that's really cool that it does and that <laughs> and 30 points is huge. So were you able to come off with some of your cholesterol medication from it?
Bien. Uh -huh. I have a question for you. How did you eat avocados five times a week? <laughs> but Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the olive oil is probably an important component. I eat I eat avocado every day, but I have I put one in a smoothie that lasts me for five days. So, in a green smoothie, yes. Okay, so, um, yes, he wanted to know why I have an aversion to supplements, which I will cover, and he also has read a book that talks about Alzheimer's and the ketogenic diet, so two parts. So first, supplements. I do not like putting anything artificial into my body, basic. I do not take supplements. I used to until I started reading research and becoming more knowledgeable, and I just won't do it. There are people at the NRI that will disagree with me, and we've had many lively debates over it. There are also people at the NRI that have research that shows that, for instance, folic acid. Folic acid is an artificial form of folate. You need folate, right? And women that are expecting to get pregnant need folate because of neural tube disorders, right? But when they found that out, they put it in the food supply so that everybody, even you, because you might get pregnant someday, so you, you need this folic acid. So it's in all the breads, it's in all, of the, it's in all the cereals, it's fortified with folic acid, which is a fake kind of folate. There's evidence over at the NRI that folic acid causes cancer. Yep because you, the natural form can't be put in a pill because food shouldn't be in a pill, it should be in a food. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but he said it for me. Supplements give you expensive pee. <laughs> but that said, food is a very individual thing. You need to eat to feeling good, which leads me to the next part of your question. You need to eat what makes you feel good. What you may not know is that it's food that's making you feel bad. So I started changing my diet two years ago. I knew that I was having a problem with wheat, and I couldn't figure out why. Why wheat? Because I've been eating wheat my whole life. So, yeah, exactly. So I cut out wheat, and I started feeling a lot better. I, I, had gone, I went from sleeping in my recliner at night because I had such bad indigestion that I couldn't lay down to feeling a lot better. Um, my brain fog went away. I couldn't even think through the day. Brain fog went away, and I'm going, okay, that was cool. Then I cut out dairy, and I'm, I'm not even kidding you when I say I hadn't been able to bend this finger for two years. For two years, it wouldn't bend and it hurt, and in the mornings, I'd wake up and my hands would be on fire. About a month after quitting dairy, I could bend my finger. So from now on, whenever I want ice cream, I just bend my finger. And it reminds me, it's just not worth it. Because the dairy causes inflammation. Causes inflammation in your joints. Pardon? It includes cheese. And it includes butter, although my graduate student swears butter is not dairy. <laughs> but, um, so the ketogenic diet is getting close to that. I also quit sugar. My knees quit hurting, so a lot of the things that you think are just, I thought my knees were hurting because I was old. My knees quit hurting when I changed my diet. My fingers started bending when I changed my diet. My brain fog went away when I changed my diet. So all these things that you think are just old age or it's just the way life is, it could be what you're eating. 
So you start experimenting and take out one food for like 30 days. So there's this program called Whole30, I think that's what they do. You take out these foods for 30 days and then you start putting them back. And see what's making you feel like crap. And don't eat it anymore because who needs to spend their life feeling like crap, right? So the ketogenic diet is one of those things. If you're on the ketogenic diet and it makes you feel fantastic, then by all means do it. For other people, that may not be the answer. The answer may be some other kind of combination of foods. But find the foods that make you feel good and find the foods that make you feel bad and adjust your diet accordingly. <laughs> so the question is, what about fruit on a ketogenic diet? Because ketogenic diet wants you to cut out sugars. So there are some fruits like blueberries, which are really important for our brains as we get older. They have very low sugar. So all those low sugar, um, back in the day, when was it? Back in like the 70s, there was the low glycemic diet came out. So if you look at the low glycemic fruits, those are the ones that you could probably eat on a ketogenic diet and get away with it. But you wouldn't want to eat things like pineapple, which is just dripping in sugars. Because anything with the ending O's, O-S-E, is a sugar. It's still a sugar, whether it's a fructose that's a natural sugar or it's one that's been adulterated by processing. It's still a sugar, right? But you need some sugars. So he's, ma he's making the point that, the, that fruit, it, it depends on how your body processes it and metabolizes it. And um, so I check my, I, I do this whole procedure every morning, checking my um, blood pressure and I check my blood sugars. I check my ketones every morning and every night. Um, and I notice that my blood sugar will go up if I have a day like I go out for spaghetti and decide I'm going to take a chance and have a piece of bread. When I'm eating the pasta and the bread, that's when my blood sugar goes up. I can eat fruit. It's, it doesn't affect my blood sugar. But it's when I eat those, the white carbs. Yep. It's the processed food. Yes. So what she's asking is whether or not the, um, all of the chemicals that are grown in corn would have an effect on the carcinogenics in the meat, and it absolutely would. It takes something that's already probably when you cook it going to cause cancer and adds another layer of, of it's going to, so you've got colon cancer, you've got some other kind of cancer from eating this meat that is it's being raised that way because it's a cheap way to do it, and we have a lot of people to feed. So I understand why. It's a way to feed the masses, right? But if the masses can afford it, they need to avoid it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's expensive, but you don't need, if you're eating really good nutritious food, you don't need as much food. You find yourself eating smaller and smaller portions because you're getting the nutrition that you need rather than eating empty calories. Yes? Would you comment on, on this whole controversy about farm-raised fish and fish in the wild? Okay. So, yeah. so she's asking about farm-raised versus wild fish. It's the same situation. They're feeding them grains. So when they raise them on a farm, they are most of the time, not always, you can get uh, the guy who sells fish at the farmer's market, the Piedmont farmer's market, says that he has researched the farm where he gets his fish and they're doing a good job. I still don't buy it. <laughs> but um, So there, there are different levels of feeding the fish, but they feed them grains also. 
So they aren't going to be getting the algae that's going to turn into DHA, so it's not going to be as quality of fish. Yes, friend. If I could add to that. Yes, please do. Um, I've done a fair amount of research on fishing and fishing. And um, one thing you want to watch out for is it says Atlantic salmon. Um, Alaska wild caught salmon. So Fran and I are actually working on an idea where we're going to start a fish farm that we feed them algae. So. <laughs> That could be. She says that there's a brand wild Alaskan, so that you have to be careful. You can tell by the color. Um, the color is different on the farm raised versus the... Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. Because, first, because of the way that it's developed. So they take algae and they force it to become fish oil, which is pretty artificial. <laughs> um, and I think that if you eat a good diet, you should be able to get that from your food. Now, that said, if you are unable to eat a good diet, supplements may be the next best choice. So um, I do a lot of speaking in Southeast Asia where they don't have access to really good food. I do say, if you can't get good food, then you need to be taking these supplements. I will go there with people that don't have access to good food. But in America, we have access to good food if we look hard enough. Um, there are people who can't afford it, and I understand that, but they also can't afford fish oil supplements because they're really expensive. So if you're gonna spend all that money on a fish oil supplement, eat a piece of good fish instead. Three servings a week? Oh, if, if you're minus a dollar. Yeah. So that might be an instance where a supplement would be very handy. Because I would say, did everybody hear that? So he is asking if you don't have a gallbladder, then you don't produce the bile, so you won't be able to absorb these nutrients as well. That may be a case where you would want to take a huge amount of fish oil every day so that you're flooding the system so that something might get through. <laughs> but it's also something you need to talk to your doctor about. Also, um, kids that have ADHD, they seem to have a need for higher DHA in their system. You can feed them a massive amount of daily fish oil and they will kind of control their symptoms. So there are places where supplements are useful. Yes? So the question is salt and high blood pressure. So interestingly, nine years ago when we opened the NRI, that was one of our pitches, was we're about individualized nutrition. So what is it about you that predisposes you towards disease in later life, and how can we ameliorate that with your nutrition? So we'll feed you now to keep you from having disease later. And one of the things that 
um, our PR person was always telling people is salt is only bad for certain people with high blood pressure. The rest of you are just eating bland food for no reason. <laughs> for me personally, I have found that iodized salt, the Morton salt that comes in the little blue thing that has sugar in it, by the way. If you're cutting out sugars, you, it has sugar in it. Read the label on your salt. It has sugar in it. <laughs> if you start reading labels, you know, dill pickles, Kloss and dill pickles have sugar in it. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I've been tracking that too. So on, the, on days when I would eat something, eat out or something, and I know I'm getting regular American salt, my blood pressure is high. If I'm eating, I can put on as much sea salt or as much Himalayan salt as I want, and my blood pressure stays normal. It's, the, it's our salt. It's not, the, it's not natural salt. That's my opinion. <laughs> you ask. <laughs> yes? Okay, so the question is, um, babies birth to three in their diet, and my opinion about that. I'm going to take it back to mother's diet during pregnancy. That sets the baby up for a certain world, so it, um, it could be adaptive in that the baby is, the placenta sets the baby up for a world that's going to be filled with crap food, or it could go the other way. We just don't have the information on that yet. Um, one of the things that we do do in my lab is we do genetic testing for a SNP that does fatty acid conversion. So 7% of the people in the United States cannot make that conversion I was talking about where they take the vegetable fatty acid and turn it into DHA. So taking alpha linolenic acid and turning it into DHA is under genetic control. And 7% of the people in this room cannot do that. Um, so we find those women, and this same sample that I showed some of these data, we have shown that those women have lower fatty acids in their breast milk, and it seriously affects baby's brain development. So we're able to tell those women, you need to make sure when you're pregnant that you are eating good fatty acid foods, eat your salmon, eat, because women don't eat fish because of fear of mercury poisoning, right? Um, Make sure you're eating fatty acids during pregnancy and during breastfeeding. So as far as the feeding of the little ones goes, I go back to whole foods. Don't buy baby food. You can make, I had this thing when I was, had little babies called Happy Baby Food Grinder. It was this little plastic thing that you'd put food off of your plate in there and turn this handle and push it down and the baby food would pop up. <laughs> Never bought a jar of baby food for my babies. Um, it's probably not convenient for most mothers, but if you're eating good food, you want your children to be eating good food, and processed baby food is not good food. Um, there, we could go on and on. I could, I could sit down and talk to you forever about it is a big area. One of the things that has really bothered me is um, having mom take fatty acids during pregnancy and having them take fatty acids when they're breastfeeding if they take them when they're pregnant, that sets the fetus up for a world that has all this DHA in it. So they're taking fish oil, and the placenta goes, oh, we've got a world that has all sorts of fatty acids in it. We don't need this conversion system that I've been talking about. So it down-regulates it, because that's a backup system. It's not meant to, take, to do the entire thing. It's just a backup system. So it gets down-regulated, and then when the baby's born, if mom's nursing, she still takes her fish oil, so the, body goes, the baby goes, oh, we do have a lot of DHA, I was right. Gets down-regulated some more, and if the, if the mom doesn't breastfeed and she puts them on formula, every formula in the country now has DHA fortified, right? So that's all happy, everything goes on, until they get weaned, 
and then they're on the same crappy low DHA diet that we all are on. Well, most of us are on. Maybe not people in this room and definitely not me. Um, and the baby system's going, wait a minute, where's my DHA? I need DHA on a daily basis to build those vesicles that are taking neurotransmitters. I need it on a daily basis. And now I don't have it. Where's my backup system? It's in a closet somewhere. So that's the kind of stuff that bothers me. And we've done some research on that and showed that if you give those babies supplements, if we had to give them supplements, if we give them supplements, they can actually, their systems seem to be set to take any little bit of fatty acid in the environment and turn it into massive benefit because their, their systems were set for that. It, it's a very interesting. We haven't quite worked it all out yet, but it's, it's coming along. Yes? Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's the relationship between EPA and DHA? And here it is. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. But EPA is one of the steps. So this is the alpha-linolenic acid. So this is the pathway for this conversion that I've been talking about. Here's the alpha-linolenic acid, which is from vegetables. And you have to get that from your diet. You cannot get that anyplace else. So it's called an essential fatty acid. Your body can't make it. You have to eat this alpha-linolenic acid. And through these steps that are controlled by genetics, you go down and make, you elongate it and desaturate it, and you get down to EPA, which is here. It's a step before it becomes DHA. So it's another type of, in that same pathway. Very important one, too, one that's studied a lot. Yes? Glucose, glucose, if you're just doing a finger poke, should be under 100. Under 100? Mm -hmm. Ketones, that depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a ketogenic diet, it can go up really high. But it, for, for, for me, just roaming around eating, it's usually 0.3 or 0.4. It keeps me happy. But I don't, I don't eat sugar. I've taken all added sugars out of my diet. I don't eat grains. And I don't eat dairy, so that I eat vegetables and meat. Yes. So you don't eat sugar. That's what the ketogenic diet's about, isn't it? So I don't have any sugar in my diet. I've found that mine will go up on days, like I said, if I go out and have a spaghetti dinner, but also on days when I'm sitting at my desk all day. It won't go up much, but it'll go up to like 116, and I think it's because I'm not moving. Yeah. Does everybody hear that? Exercise decreases the spike that you get after eating. So if you exercise after you eat, it'll decrease that insulin spike. Yes? Eggs? No, I don't. I think eggs are good for you. I do. I eat probably. I was eating a dozen a week, but I got to the point where I could only eat so many eggs. So now I'm down to about a dozen every two weeks or so, but I eat a lot of eggs. I, They've got all the nutrients that you need in them. And if you're throwing away the yolk and have an egg white omelet, you're throwing away the best part. <laughs> so, so the question is, how should you cook your eggs? And, and I don't know. I cook my eggs so that I can eat them. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't know the answer to that. I could tell you about blueberries, about cooking blueberries, but <laughs> so you should blueberries. Blueberries should be eaten first. It should be wild blueberries that you can buy at the store in the frozen food section. You can't get wild blueberries fresh because they they can't travel, so they come down from Maine frozen. You can get them over here at Foodland. Wyman's has a three-pound bag. I go through about a, one of those every week, 
and you can just eat them like candy. Don't cook them. It ruins the bioactives in it. The wild blueberries have more phytochemicals. They have like, I don't know the exact figure, but it's huge amount of anthocyanins compared to the, the high, the, what we call the high bush. Um, it's just the way they are. They're little and they're packed full of goodness. <laughs> Over at Foodland, I think they have them at Harris Teeter too. It's just in the frozen food section, they have a bag of Wyman's wild blueberries. Costco has them. So he's asking about the results from my blueberry powder study. Um, so I did a blueberry intervention with older folks, 65 to, to 70. They're supposed to be 79, but this old woman lied about her age so she could get into the study. <laughs> she was 80. <laughs> I could not believe she's at that age. She's still lying about her age. But anyway. <laughs> Um, so we, it ended up being 65 to 80, and what we found, we put them on blueberry powders for six months. So we had to use a processed blueberry because we couldn't store fresh wild blueberries for that long. It took us three years to complete the study. So we had um, these powders that were freeze-dried blueberries that were pulverized. So we took the, the blueberries straight from Maine and sent them to a packing company that freeze-dried them and packaged them for us. And the people were taking the equivalent of two cups of blueberries a day, which seems like a lot, but I wanted to make sure that I was hitting them enough to find an effect if there was going to be an effect. I didn't want to get to the end and go, well, maybe we didn't give them enough, because it was a huge study. So um, they were on them for six months. We had a placebo group that was on this stuff that was kind of like grape Kool-Aid. The stuff was nasty. So because of that, we couldn't take anybody that was diabetic, so that cut down our chances. We made sure everybody was healthy. You had to either be healthy or have a, something that was controlled. So you could have high blood pressure, but it had to have been controlled for the last year to be in the study. And then we had another group that were regular older folks that didn't have any mild cognitive decline. Sorry, the ones doing the powders, they had mild cognitive decline. Um, taking the same test that, that our president took a couple weeks ago. Um, so the um, reference group was because I didn't know anything about studying old people. I didn't know what to expect from them after six months. How quickly are they going to decline if they start declining? So what we ended up finding was that the blueberries helped with speed of processing. So if you were in the blueberry group, you were not only did it stop your mild cognitive decline, the people on the placebo kept declining. The people on the blueberries stopped declining and they had faster speed of processing. So every cognitive test we threw at them, they were doing it more quickly than even the reference group, even the people that were just free living. So it's, it's exciting. And we've just got the um, ERP, the electrophysiology net stuff. We just got that all done, and we're ready to start writing up the paper. So that should be coming out soon. Is that it? <laughs> One more. <laughs> Yep. So the question is, are we doing any work on the microbiome, which is the, the gut flora stuff that is not only really important for your digestion and evidently, according to some of the research I showed you tonight, for preventing colon cancer, um, it's also really important for your brain because some of the neurotransmitters are actually produced in the gut. So serotonin, which I'm sure you're familiar with, comes from the gut. So your gut has to be in balance so your brain can be in balance. So there's this gut-brain axis going on. And we are actually just starting microbiome work with the, the sample from the Berry study. Those people came back in for a follow-up session. They had either been, in, been out of the study for one, two, or three years when we brought them back in. I wanted to see what was happening with them because I had a, a wife call me up and say, my husband has just gone downhill since he's been off the study. And it concerned me, but when I finally got to break the blind on the study, he was on placebo. 
So he was actually benefiting from coming in and doing all the cognitive tests and hanging out with the cute girls and you know all the all the social interaction. <laughs> but um, so I wanted I brought them all back in so I could see what happened to them after we saw them last. And Grant is my graduate student is just now analyzing all those data and he has microbiome samples on them so we can look at um, how that relates to not only all the medications that they were on but their cognitive performance is very important. So thanks for that question. That's work coming up. One more. Are there foods that promote the development of those organisms in your gut? Are there foods that promote the development of organisms in your gut? The answer is yes. Fermented foods. Sauerkraut, yogurt, um, things that are kimchi. <laughs> um, so things that are fermented because the ferment, fermentation starts the bacteria process going. I, again, do not think that you can get your probiotics for your gut microbiome from a pill. That just doesn't make any sense. They're live organisms. How can they be stuffed in a little pill? That doesn't make any sense to me. Kombucha, yes, kombucha too. And kefir. So those types of foods that are fermented. I personally like sauerkraut, so that's what I do about once a week is some sauerkraut. All right. Okay. I'm going to... Um cut it off here just because I want to be mindful of everybody's time, including Dr. Cheatham's. And thank you all for coming out for a great evening. You've been a wonderful and attentive audience. And um, please stay tuned for information about our next program. And thank Dr. Cheatham. So I'm actually working with